about once a month, usually on the fourth Sunday morning of the month, and all of our services are in the morning now, but we have a lesson devoted to covering some Bible-related questions. And when possible, I'd like to try to tie these in with where we are, or at least where we've just been in our daily Bible reading, sort of help us maybe reinforce Again, what we've read, maybe address some things that we came across and might not have understood while we read. So we try to, we try to do that, and we've done that with the questions we'll be looking at for this morning. I find it helpful whenever I read my Bible or study it to have a pen and pad there with me uh, because I'll come across something and I'll say, I wonder what that means, and I forget to write it down. And then a couple of days later, what was it I was wondering about? I don't remember because I didn't write it down, so I try to have something there handy to write down so I don't forget, or at least jot it uh, in notes in my cell phone, and that way I'll, I'll have that. Again, we think about questions of the Bible. We know that there are people who ask questions with ulterior motives in mind. They do not believe the Bible and are not content with that. They don't want you to believe the Bible either. It's one thing to reject the Bible. It's another thing to want others to reject the Bible just because you do. And there are people who will ask questions of the Bible with that in mind. And so we want to be ready with, obviously, a response to those. But again, some questions are just asked out of wanting to know more or maybe curious about a matter. Now, the two questions we'll be looking at, we have really both motives in mind. The first question is a question that really, the answer to that really deals with salvation issues. And that's something that we obviously want to make sure that we look at very closely. We want to defend the truth without being defensive. Sometimes we defend the truth and get defensive at the same time, and we don't want to do that. We want to defend the truth and speak it in love, obviously for all involved. The second question we'll be looking at really is more of a matter of curiosity, and it will not affect our destiny eternally one way or the other, so we can just look at that. Really no pressure on that question, but the first question is a bit of a different matter. Again, these two questions do come from recent daily Bible readings. We want to look at the evidence that is available and then make up our own minds based on that evidence. First question was, who was the prophet God predicted he would send like Moses? Was the prophet Muhammad or was the prophet Jesus? Now here we'll be looking at what Adam read for us, a couple of verses from that at this point, Deuteronomy 18. Instead of 15 through 18, we'll con uh, concentrate on verse 15 and 18. This is, first of all, Moses speaking to Israel, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brothers like to me. Unto him you shall hearken. Now the second verse, verse 18, is God speaking. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, Moses, like you, Moses. And I will put words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And so, who's the prophet under consideration here? If you are a bit familiar with the Islamic religion, you know their interpretation of this verse. They do not believe that Moses is talking about Jesus in this verse. They believe that God is, or Moses is both talking about Muhammad. From, he is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. Now here's some of the reasoning they give <coughs> for that. Notice that the, the prediction is God will raise up a prophet like Moses from the midst of thee of thy brethren, of thy kin, of thy brothers, literally. Now we know, they would say, that the Israelites, Jews, and the Ishmaelites, Arabs, were brothers. In fact, Isaac, the Jews came from Isaac, and the Arabs came from Ishmael. We know they were brothers. They were both sons of Abraham, and we know that Muhammad descended through Ishmael, Therefore, that would, he would have fit the description of being one of the brothers of those under consideration in this particular passage. And so they say he was the one raised up from among their brothers, since they were at least related. Well, response to that, in the same context though, of Deuteronomy 18, 
the term brethren refers not to Ishmaelites. It refers, the whole context is talking about Israelites. Notice verses 1 and 2 of the text. Addressing, first of all, the priests, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, will not have an inheritance with Israel. They would partake of the sacrifices. They wouldn't have any farmland. God would meet their needs. But the point is, they shall have no inheritance, inheritance among their brethren. He's talking about the Jewish brethren in the whole chapter, not the descendants of Ishmael. Yes, Muhammad came from Ishmael, as uh, those of the Islamic persuasion admit, but heirs to the Jewish throne came from Isaac. Note what Abraham prayed to God. When God promised Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have numerous descendants, so many you can't count. Abraham initially thought that promise would be through Ishmael. In fact, Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He obviously must be the one God that you're going to bless all nations with. God's response was, My covenant is not going to be with Ishmael. My covenant will I establish with Isaac. Genesis 17, verse 21. And later God repeated, In Isaac, not Ishmael, but in Isaac, your descendants or your seed shall be called. Well, certainly, Moses and Ishmael were related, but there were others likewise related. The Edomites were, in a sense, brothers to the Israelites. One could just as easily argue that a descendant of Esau was the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, if you're just basing this on blood relatives. And, of course, there's more involved than that. And so the argument that they were related really holds no weight. What proves too much proves nothing is a response to that. Notice another argument that is made that Jesus could not be the prophet in consideration here. The prediction is that God will raise up the prophet unto thee from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. That is, the prophet that God would raise up would be like Moses. Well... Those of the Islamic persuasion say Jesus was nothing like Moses and could not have been that prophet. Could not have been talking about him, they say. Here are some for instances. Moses was born with a human father and mother. Jesus had no human father. They weren't alike. Moses married and had children. Jesus never married, never had children. They weren't alike. Moses was born naturally. Jesus was born miraculously of a virgin. They were not alike. The prediction was, the prophet God would raise up would be like Moses. Their response, Jesus was nothing like Moses and therefore could not be the prophet under consideration here. He could not have uh, fulfilled that prophecy. Well, response to that is, saying Jesus was to be like Moses did not mean he would be identical to Moses. That wasn't the point. No two people are exactly alike. For that matter... Moses and Muhammad had numerous differences. If you're going to argue the one, you might as well argue the other. Moses was born in Egypt. Muhammad born in Mecca. Moses died at age 120. Muhammad died at age 63. One could easily argue they were nothing alike either. So how, how could he, again, be the fulfillment of that prophecy? Well, again, the point being... Like Moses and being identical to Moses are two completely different things, and that was not the point of the prophecy. Jesus and Moses were not identical, but they did have a number of similarities. Think about some of them. Kings sought to destroy both when they were babies. Pharaoh tried to kill Moses, and Herod tried to kill Jesus. Both were sent by God, both Moses and Jesus sent by God to be deliverers. Moses to deliver the Israelites, Jesus to deliver all mankind from the bondage of sin. Both proved their authenticity by miracles. The plagues that Moses brought helped bring upon the Egyptians and so forth. Jesus performing all the miracles, walking on water, feeding, healing the sick, raising the dead. Both gave laws from God. Moses gave the law of Moses, Jesus gave the law of Christ. Both mediated on behalf of their people. Moses, again, would often go to intercede before God for the Israelites. Jesus is our mediator today. Both supplied bread for their people. Manna from heaven in Moses' day and Jesus himself 
fed thousands with bread, but also was the bread of life. And both were specially tended by God at their death. In fact, God buried Moses when Moses died. And certainly God came and, and strengthened Jesus when he uh, died there on the cross. And so to say Jesus and Moses were nothing alike is simply to misstate the case. They were alike in many ways, not identical. No, that wasn't the point, but they indeed were alike, had similarities. And obviously Peter provides the answer of who the prophet uh, was under consideration here on the 18, Acts 3. He speaks of God sending Jesus, which of course God did, and then quotes Deuteronomy 18, what Moses said, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brothers like to me. Him shall you hear in all things, whatever he shall say unto you. And of course, for us, that forever settles the matter. Peter says Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Of course, our Islamic friends don't believe. Uh, the New Testament and would not accept what Peter says here anyway, but that's another lesson for a different time. But again, Jesus being the fulfillment of the prophet under consideration in Deuteronomy 18. Second question, what was the hornet God promised to send against the enemies of Israel as Israel came to the promised land? Now this is, again, you come across this when you read uh, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Exodus, and, and Joshua, to name a few, and we can agree to disagree on this matter. Now, this was vital in that day to help Israel conquer Canaan, but whatever this means has no bearing, whatever, on our salvation today. So we're not going to be dogmatic on anything on this point. We will uh, look at some things, but again, this would not uh, affect our eternal salvation. However, we respond to this, and we, unless we just flat out deny it and said it didn't happen, then we would be reflecting on the inspired Word of God. There are several Old Testament texts that mention God's using hornets against the enemies of Israel. Here are three. God is speaking. This before the fact. I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out, drive out the Hivite, Canaanite, and Hittite from before thee. That is, these, all these ites were those people who lived in the land of Canaan. This land would be the promised land. Hadn't happened as of Exodus, God predicting this is what I will do. Deuteronomy 7.20, this again, God predicting what he will do. They're not there yet, but this is what I will do. Moses speaking, God will send the hornet among them, that is the people in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. So that's looking forward to God doing that. Joshua 7, or Joshua 24, is looking back to what God had done. God says, I did send the hornet as I promised. I did send the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And so the question is, what exactly is going on here with this hornet that God promised to send and which God says he did send as of Joshua's time? In what sense is the word hornet used in these passages? There are a number of possibilities. We're going to look at three. I think three of the most logical, feasible. Some say the hornet that God promised to send against the enemies of Israel actually was the nation of Egypt. God's use of Egypt to weaken enemy forces in Canaan before Israel ever arrived in Canaan. Some believe that Egypt waged campaigns against the Canaanites before Israel ever got there. Egypt obviously wanted to expand their territory, wanting more riches, you can never have enough of that. And so their raids, inroads into the Canaanites and their fighting them weakened the Canaanite armies so that by the time Israel arrived, they had little trouble driving out the Canaanites. Egypt then would have been, in that sense, the hornet that God sent to deal with the Canaanites. Uh, some would say God calling them the hornet would be a lot like sports teams today. We'll use uh, nicknames, if you will, or handles to identify their team. Georgia Tech, who are they? Yellow Jackets, am I right? Georgia Tech, 
What about the Charlotte NBA team? What are they? Hornets. There you go. In other words, if you play Georgia Tech or Charlotte, the implication from the very name, you'd best be on your toes. You'd best be ready for a battle. Normally, sports teams try to pick tough sounding names, except Delta State. You know what their nickname is, don't you? The Fighting Okra. Don't you know that strikes terror in any team playing them? We're gonna play the Fighting Okra today. Why they picked that name? That's sort of like the boxer. Years ago, there was a boxer named Wimpy. His name literally was Wimpy, and people just laughed and laughed when they saw him in the ring. He looked, he looked Wimpy, but he actually beat a bunch of folks. He, he was stronger than his name actually implied. And so that's uh, what some say. The hornet that God promised to send actually was the nation of Egypt. Now, there's a bit of a problem with that view, and you need to add the word little on your handout. I've got no evidence. There is little evidence. I would say little to no evidence. There actually is no biblical evidence that this ever happened. Some would say there is archaeological evidence that it did happen. The hornet, some tell us, was a symbol of the Egyptians. The insect is found pictured in their hieroglyphics. And uh, finds, digs have been discovered that indicate that the Egyptians did make numerous raids into the land of Canaan. The problem would be dating that to the exact same time as this, in my mind, would be a tall order, but that is one possibility. Another possibility, some would say, that the word hornet is to be taken literally. Literally, the hornet, God sent literal hornets to drive the Canaanites out of the land. Just as in the plagues of Egypt, God used literal frogs to torment the Egyptians. He used literal lice, literal flies, literal locusts to eat up the crops. Adam's been teaching us Amos in his sermons on Sunday morning, talked last week about the palmer worm or the locust that God sent to cause damage to crops, a calamity. Well, folks, there's no doubt that God could very well have sent hornets into the land of Canaan and sent in massive enough numbers it would have driven them out of their homes and out of their land, believe you me. I think about this, I think about a congregation I preached for up in Tennessee while I was in school, and I've told this before, but one Easter Sunday, that little building was packed full of people. I, you couldn't find a place to sit. Wish every Sunday had been like that, but you know, that one Sunday. But in the event, it was cool in there. They had three drop-down lights, fluorescent lights, and they had a problem with wasps in that building, and that morning those wasps had covered three of those lights, about, what, four-foot-long wasps all over them. It was cool in the building, and I thought to myself, as long as they don't turn the heat on, we're going to be fine. And somebody must have read my mind and turned the heat on. We had to dismiss services early. Uh, one got down a lady's dress and stung her, and she screamed out, and it was all over after that. Uh, so if God wanted to send hornets to drive out people out of the land of Canaan, he certainly, he certainly could have done that. I've never been stung by a hornet. Now, I've been stung. I, I killed one of those gentlemen over there this morning, a red wasp. You know, those long, bright orange red wasp. We, my dad and I were working in my grandmother's attic one day, and I put my hand on one of the joists to steady myself, and there was a wasp there. And it stung me, and it felt like putting your hand on the eye of a stove that was on. That's how bad it hurt. Those who have been stung by hornets say that's nothing compared to a hornet sting. I, I, I don't know. You can go on YouTube. I hate to call people idiots, <laughs> but I can't think of a better term. There are, are, are individuals who will take rocks. One has a camera and the other is throwing rocks at a hornet's nest. And the outcome of that well, you can guess, the, you cannot outrun a hornet. <laughs> I can't, and, and they couldn't either. And I can't think of a better term to describe them than, than that. Researchers tell us an adult, get this, an adult can withstand 1,000 hornet stings and survive. 
A child, a healthy child, can withstand 500 hornet stings and survive. How do they know that? <laughs> How on, are you going to stand there and let a hornet sting you a thousand times to, to see if it actually, how they know that, I don't know. We, we know that there are people who are allergic and one sting could be fatal. What's the anaphylactic shock, I think it's called. Well, there's a gentleman right there. That's a hornet and he looks bad, doesn't he? He looks awfully bad, but he's not as bad as the new species that's sort of invaded our country. The giant, the Asian giant hornet, called the murder hornet, has been found in Washington State. Called the murder hornet, it doesn't murder people, it murders honeybees is the, is the threat. And honeybees are vital to pollination, pollination of vital growing crops, and so no honeybees, no pollination, no pollination, no crops. And so these things can care less about us as long as we leave them alone, but they do feed on honeybees. They pack a potent sting. On the top we have our hornet native to this country. The bottom hornet is the giant Asian hornet. It's what, three times larger than our hornet. Uh, and and uh, one fellow said he was stung by one it felt like somebody took a hot nail and a hammer and just drove that into his leg. Now as fierce as these things look and as painful the sting, they actually kill only a few people a year uh, in the countries where they are, are native. But a massive invasion would drive people out of a land in large enough numbers. So some view the hornet that God promised to send to drive out the Canaanites as literal hornets, just like literal frogs in Egypt, lice, flies, and locusts, and so forth. There's a bit of a problem, though, with that view. When Israel arrived in Canaan, there were no hornets. They had to fight the enemy. They themselves had to fight the enemy. When, uh, when you read the book of Joshua, they came to the first city of the conqueror of Jericho. They came to Jericho, they didn't just walk in and take over the city because hornets had driven everybody out. That's not what the Bible says. They had to march around the city. God knocked the walls flat and they went in, Israel went in and conquered the people of Jericho. You go throughout the book of Joshua and you don't read of hornets, literal hornets, you do read of Israel having to fight the enemies in the land. So if God sent literal hornets into the land to drive the enemy out, there were no hornets that drove anybody out. Israel again had to fight. The enemy is a problem with, with that view. Again, Joshua 24, 12, looking back, God said, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites. Notice when this happened, Numbers 21, Sahan was one of the two kings of the Amorites. God said, I'd send the hornet before them, but notice that it was Israel, not the hornets, but Israel who smote him with the edge of the sword. If God said, I sent literal hornets to deal with Sihon, then why did Israel have to smite him with the edge of a sword? Is one problem I see with taking the hornet view literally. Now certainly God could have done that. We have no doubt that he could have done that. The question is, did he use literal hornets to do that? A third possibility is the word hornet is used figuratively to denote the working of God to precede the arrival of Israel. Notice in Exodus 23, 20 to 28, God said in the same context, I will send an angel. Then he said, I will send my fear. Then he said, I will send hornets. Again, three phrases stating the same basic message. And so again, when Israel came to Canaan, we don't read of hornets, but we do read the Canaanites were deathly afraid of Israel. Notice, remember when the spies came to Rahab, what Rahab said to the spies? She said, I know the Lord, God, Lord has given you the land and that your terror is falling upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint, not because of hornets, literally, but because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, 
whom you, not hornets, but whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, not because of literal hornets. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And so the hornet would be the fear, really, of God that preceded the arrival of the Israelites. So much so, there wasn't a whole lot of fight in many of the Canaanites simply because of fear. Well, again, you have to make up your own mind, and there are other possibilities we don't have time to look at. Keep in mind, though, that whatever the hornet is here, it did not remove the responsibility of Israel to do their own fighting. They still had to fight. God said, you're going to win, but it's not going to be because you wield a mighty sword or a bow, but you still have to fight. The victory is going to be given by God, but you still have to fight. Whatever the horn it is, Israel still had to fight is the idea. Now, a point of application as we close. We know the age of the miraculous has ceased. There's no need for miracles today with a completed revelation of God, but that does not mean that God no longer works. The providential working of God through nature, through events, through circumstances still help His people, still help us in the church. We wouldn't bother praying if we didn't believe that God didn't work at all in our lives. We know that God works, that's why we pray. And any victories we win in evangelism, in benevolence, in edification, are not victories that we won by ourselves. They are won because of the power of God accomplishing His will in the affairs of men. And so we give Him all the glory and Him all the credit. But still, though God works, He expects us to do our part. Just as God used the hornet, whatever it was, but Israel still had their part to play in driving out the land, or the people of the land. And so two very good questions. And now having examined the, what evidence is available, you have to come up with the answer in your own mind. Regarding salvation, the Bible is crystal clear. Now there's no wobble room here. Really no room for disagreement here. Scripture is plain. God loved the world. So much so he sent his son Jesus to die as a perfect sacrifice to atone for the sins of men. God has done his part, but again, he expects us to do our part. Our part, our, our part is that I mentioned in his lesson as he closed. Hearing the gospel, faith in God's son Jesus, repenting of our sins, confessing our Lord before men, and being baptized. God says, I love you, Wayne. I sent my son to die for you, but I'm not going to do it all. You have a responsibility. And having become a Christian, God says, Wayne, you still have a responsibility now of not living as you please, but the responsibility of living for me, being faithful. I know you stumble, and you can repent, and people can pray for you, and I'll forgive you again and again and again. I've done my part. Make sure, Wayne, that you do yours as well. And we close with this reminder. Though God's methods to help His people have changed, and there's no doubt those methods have changed. He does not send literal hornets or plagues as such today uh, to accomplish His will, but His love for His people has not changed. God still works. God still saves. God still helps in different ways, but His love has not changed for us. He loves you this morning. If you need to respond to him, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing?